Our guest speaker is the inaugural speaker of our Women in Charge series, uh, which will feature prominent leaders from the public and private sector at our podium. So thank you, uh, uh, Linda, for being here today and, and kicking this off. The invention of the automobile has transformed human life. In fact, at this very podium in 1952, Henry Ford II addressed the club. He spoke of the impact of several American inventions, including that of his grandfather's. He said, when you set free the creative energies of millions of individuals, you release an explosive force that performs miracles for all mankind. A Michigan farm boy set to work the principles of mass production that gave inexpensive transportation to hundreds of millions of people. Our guest speaker today is someone who is continuing the legacy of Mr. Ford. Linda Hasenfratz is one of the world's foremost, foremost leaders in the automotive industry. I wonder if Mr. Ford would have ever thought that a woman would take on such an important role in the industry that he created. Linda is the chief executive officer of Linamar Corporation, a company founded by her father in 1966. Although she has her MBA from the Ivy School of Business, she literally started her career at the bottom, having experienced life on the line as a machine operator. She is a mother and a wife, and since her appointment as CEO, Linda has grown the company to over $3 billion in sales. Linamar Corporation has over 17,000 employees, and they operate in North America, Europe, and Asia. Linda is on the board of the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce and on the Royal Ontario Museum. It's with great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, that I ask you to welcome our guest speaker, Ms. Linda Hasenfrance, to the Empire Club of Canada. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. It's a real pleasure for me to be here this afternoon. Uh, I think I can safely assume that none of you were here for Henry Ford's speech, <laughs> which is good. So I, do, I don't have to uh, worry about uh, living up to, uh, to that ideal. But I hope you learned a little something about the automotive industry today. I'm, I'm uh, here to tell you a little bit about that and also to talk a little bit about Lindemar and our company and how we run our business and what we think uh, has made us successful uh, over the years. So uh, I'll start off with Lindemar and tell you a little bit about our company. We're a diversified manufacturing company. Uh, about two-thirds of our sales is focused on the automotive uh, industry. Uh, the balance is made up of work we do for commercial vehicle customers, both on highway and off highway. Uh, as well as the energy uh, market uh, and the access equipment market, where we make scissor lifts, boom lifts, and telehandlers under the brand name Skyjack. Uh, in our automotive business, uh, we make a variety of precision machined components and assemblies and even full systems for engine, transmission, and driveline areas of uh, the vehicle. The same kind of products we would be making for our commercial vehicle customers. Uh, we have design involvement in those products increasingly as time uh, goes on. Uh, more on the system side and, and more design work uh, on the driveline side of the vehicle. So for instance, we make full all-wheel drive systems uh, for, uh, for vehicles to create all-wheel drive and improve uh, uh, drivability of vehicles. We would be fully design responsible for those products as well as doing all the uh, manufacturing for that. Sales last year, as you heard, were north of $3 billion. Uh, it's been uh, a very exciting uh, opportunity that I've had over the last decade as CEO of Lindemar to take something that my father uh, started. Where's my father? There he is. Uh, uh, back in <laughs> 1966. Uh, he named Linamar, by the way, after myself, my sister Nancy, and my mother Margaret. So the L I N A. So when my sister's not around, I do claim the N. I should uh, I should mention that. Don't tell her. Uh, but it's been a great opportunity to take uh, something that my father started and grew so incredibly uh, over that 25, 30-year uh, time period, and get to try and. 
uh, be part of our continued uh, growth. And we really see just so much opportunity in each one of those different areas of our business to continue to, uh, to grow the company. Uh, my father came to Canada in uh, the late 50s with literally nothing in his pocket, but he had a really important asset, and that was a skill. Uh, he's a skilled machinist and mach uh, uh, learned his trade in his native Hungary and came here with that skill and used that skill to build this business. You know, and, and I mention that because I, I worry that our young people today are not as interested in pursuing a career in skilled trades when in, in actuality you can have massive success by doing that, by, by doing that trade itself, which is a highly lucrative uh, career on its own, but also can be such a fantastic stepping stool in terms of starting your own business just like my father did or being part of a growing an entrepreneurial company like Lindemar. I mean, I look at the, the people who are running our plants, our general managers, and over half of them came from the shop floor. They're either skilled tradespeople or operators who you know, ha showed a flair for leadership and were able to, uh, to grow in our company into, into that position. We've tried to build uh, a company at Linamar with a, a really solid culture a great culture around, centered around being entrepreneurial, being excited about growing our business, growing the top line, but also uh, growing the bottom line and not forgetting that that's absolutely critical in, uh, in, success, in successful growth. Uh, you know, we're also all about balance, balanced decision making. You hear us talk uh, quite a lot about balancing customer, employee, and financial satisfaction. Uh, in, in everything that we do. And that's, that's really critical. And you're going to hear me talk more about balance in other uh, aspects of how we, we go about running our business. But that's certainly a key, key part uh, of our culture at Linamar. We are respectful, respectful of our people, uh, respectful of uh, the work that they do and the importance uh, that they play in our organization. And I think our people appreciate that and therefore work uh, in, in accordance. And that's certainly been a big part. That's something my father taught me a long, long time ago, is to be respectful of our people. We're a very responsive company. Uh, one of our customers, Caterpillar, uh, we do, we do off-highway, as I mentioned, uh, business as well as on-highway, and, and Caterpillar's a big customer, call us the 911 of the automotive industry because they know if they've got a problem, uh, they can give us a call and we can quickly help them out of their, uh, of their issue. I remember a situation uh, a few years ago where uh, Caterpillar had a plant in the southern U.S. that was unfortunately hit by a tornado uh, and pretty much completely destroyed. Now, happily, nobody was hurt, uh, but what they realized when this uh, incident happened, because they were fully shut down in terms of production, was that the parts that they were making in this plant actually went into almost every piece of Caterpillar equipment made worldwide. So the, the shutdown of this one plant uh, literally had the ability to bring this multi-billion dollar company to its knees in a matter of weeks. Uh, they called us up, asked us how quickly we could get tooled up on to make these components. Within three or four days, we had, we had submitted our first uh, samples and within five or six days, we were in production and never shut Caterpillar down. So I think that kind of responsiveness is really key. I mean, it's certainly what brings our customers to us and what brings them back to us that we can help them in those situations, which then, of course, brings back long-term business uh, after that. And lastly, I, we've got a, a, a culture that is absolutely grounded in innovation and in hard work and how we go about doing things. And you can really see that throughout the company in terms of the products we're designing in our driveline business and the processes that we design to make our products uh, right through. You know, I talked about the idea of balance. And another thing that we're always trying to balance is having the right amount of consistency and conformity in how we go about doing things, the right amount of standardization with enough independence of decision making to really encourage that innovation and ingenuity. And you know, we, when we have uh, important stakeholders like our customers, like our bankers, uh,
pushing us for conformity, right? They want everything to be done exactly the same because that's going to mitigate risk and, and allow them to be assured of um, a low risk uh, situation. I think shareholders too are looking for uh, low risk. But I think that conformity really stifles a, what's a key element of success and that's innovation and ingenuity. And that's why you have to strike that right balance. Pick the things that you think are really critical that you're going to dictate everybody has to, to utilize in running their plants, but leave enough discretion in terms of that decision making and what they're doing that they can control their outcome and they can come up with some fantastic ideas that we can share around the company. And I think that that's really an important part of keeping that entrepreneurial spirit alive that you know, is so much a part of my father and therefore everybody that, has, that he's touched within our organization. And, and certainly it's something that we constantly uh, are trying to do is to continue to simplify the things that we have tried to dictate of how we go about doing things uh, and uh, really let that entrepreneurial spirit thrive. You know, I think you can crush an entrepreneur if the rule book is too big, um, but by the same token, they can erupt in flames if they don't have a few guidelines to, uh, to work around. So we do need to, to mitigate risk. So I wanted to talk a little bit about running a successful business. And, and some of these concepts, I think, can be applied in really any business. It doesn't have to be even manufacturing, uh, or certainly doesn't have to be automotive. And uh, what we've tried to look at at Linamar is that there's three important things that we need to focus on to have a successful and prosperous business. Number one, we need to always stay competitive. Of course, you have to be competitive in order to win business. And you stay competitive by focusing on a combination of innovation and efficiency, right? So the, again, the products that we're designing, we're designing products that our customers want, that our customers need, that help to solve their problems, and then designing processes that are more efficient, uh, you know, to, to better repeatability, better quality, uh, faster than uh, the next guy. Absolutely key to competitiveness. And then, of course, running an absolutely efficient, lean operation that you've done a good job around planning out your line, you're doing a good job of purchasing, you're doing a good job of managing your, your labor costs. So competitiveness, of course, is key to, to prosperity. But also key is having a, a market of opportunity. I mean, you have to have opportunity. My father saw opportunity in the automotive business uh, in the mid-80s and started to really focus uh, our organization in that area. So you have to have a good strategy where you've identified what you want to make, who are you going to make it for, how are you going to compete, think about, you know, what do, what do people like the least about this product? What do they hate about this product or that service? And how can you fix that and therefore have a real competitive advantage uh, to get out there and take advantage of the opportunity? And the last key is, again, culture. So having a great, solid culture in the organization that people really understand that you're doing a good job of communicating with people around, that you're doing a good job of rewarding performance, and that you're also demonstrating it at every level. Because I can't tell people to be entrepreneurial if I'm not acting entrepreneurial. My father can't do that, and neither, neither can anyone else in the organization. We have to act that way as well, so we have to, to demonstrate. You know, when I look at uh, innovation, a couple of examples, process innovation is, is something that we've always been really good at at Linamar. I mean, leading edge, machining and assembly capability, and I think a great example of that is our gear business. About, about 10 years ago, we looked at the global gear business, which is somewhere close to $30 billion of potential market. Uh, and decided that the, the intricacy and the, the, the challenge around producing a gear was something that really fit well with our, our strength and our capabilities. Uh, and decided we wanted to focus in on the gear market. Set up a small gear shop inside of one of our plants in Guelph. And today we're making more than 20 million gears a year for a variety of customers in a variety of, of applications. We've developed some really innovative processing around gears, helical gear grinding, leading edge stuff around processing. And that's really, I think, what has brought that gear business 
uh, to us and is a critical element in us continuing to build that and other elements of our business. On the product innovation side, equally important, you know, to have products that your customers need, that their customers need. And a good example of that, I think, is a, a new product that we've uh, just launched this year. It's an electronically actuated axle, uh, which can turn almost any vehicle into a hybrid vehicle uh, and give you better control and functionality around driving, uh, driving a vehicle. It was very well uh, received by our customer base, and we're excited about the opportunities uh, for that business in the future. And before you ask, no, we haven't gotten an order yet. I can see you want to ask that question. <laughs> but I think it's, uh, it's key to have that, you know, to have that product innovation to bring your customers uh, to you. So let's turn to the automotive industry and talk a little bit about what's going on in the automotive industry uh, here in North America. So this year, we're going to produce a little bit more than 16 million vehicles in North America as a whole, Mexico, Canada, and, and the US. Uh, North America is the smallest of the three major global uh, centers of North America, Europe, and uh, Asia. So we're making 16 million vehicles. It's about a little bit less than 20%, 19% of global production. More than 50% of global production is centered in Asia a combination of Japan, Korea, and China. China, of course, being uh, as big as North America on its own and growing at a much, much faster rate. Europe, even with the issues that they've uh, had economically over the last few years, is still larger than the market here in North America. It's around 22 23% of the global marketplace. So, you know, I think, to me, we, we look at that and think, you know, we've grown uh, our company to more than $3 billion dollars focused on a market that's the smallest market in the world uh, in terms of uh, automotive, which is the largest, about two-thirds of our business. So imagine if we can do the same thing in Asia uh, and in Europe that we've done here in North America, which of course is a key goal for us is to, to globalize um, uh, our business. In terms of market share here in North America, uh, market share hasn't really shifted very much over the last five years in the major players here in North America. A few percentage points here and there, but otherwise it's been pretty steady as she goes. Ford and GM are sort of neck and neck at around seven, between 17 and 19 uh, percent of the market here in North America each. Toyota is sitting at around 12 to, to 14 percent. Chrysler is pretty close to Toyota. They're around 10 to 12 percent. Uh, and Honda and Hyundai each have about 8 to 10 percent of the market. So, you know, it's, it's a pretty good split. It's not changing very much, which might surprise you. I think that uh, I've had a lot of people, you know, know I'm in the automotive industry and, and say, uh, you know, oh, well, Toyota, Honda are, you know, dominant in the North American market. That's not the case, not in North America. You know, when you look at the, the global picture, Absolutely, Toyota is, uh, is right up there vying for the number one spot with Volkswagen. But believe me, Volkswagen has absolutely got their eye on that prize and are pushing hard uh, to be number one. You know, we see Volkswagen, GM, and Toyota uh, alternating in, in terms of their number one position on a, a global basis. Uh, they're followed, so they, they would make, let's say, nine to 10 million vehicles uh, a year each. Uh, GM maybe a little bit less than that, let's say around 8 million. Renault and Hyundai also about 8 million vehicles uh, each, and then followed by Ford at around 6 million. And the reason I, I bring this up and, and, and quote these figures for you is so that you can see the really diverse mixture on a global basis in terms of the, the regionality of these automakers. I mean, it's an interesting blend uh, the Asians, the Europeans, and the Americans at each level, right? Number one spot, Volkswagen, Toyota, and, and GM are, are vying for number one. And then, you know, the next round is also uh, an Asian, uh, a French, and an American manufacturer. So interesting to see. Also interesting to see the, the very significant position that both GM and Ford hold on a global basis because, again, I'm often asked, Oh, why do you want to do business for GM and Ford? You know, they're, uh, they're not important. They're, they're critical players, okay? They're critical players. They're in the, the top five manufacturers globally producing, you know, 
15 to 20 million vehicles a year, of course we're going to target doing business uh, with those customers. So it's, you know, it's easy to be misled by you know, some of the media stories you might see around what's happening with market share, and I thought you might be interested in understanding what's really uh, happening there. Uh, I do think that production levels will increase in North America. I don't think they're going to increase dramatically uh, in the short term, but they will continue to increase at a little bit higher rate than the sales level. And the reason that I say that is I believe that we're going to see more uh, vehicles produced in North America that are being sold here. So at the moment, there's still a lot of vehicles being imported into uh, North America by either the Japanese or, uh, or the Europeans. And increasingly due to higher and higher logistics cost, uh, currency issues that have really hurt them over the last uh, several years, they're looking to put production where they're selling the vehicles. So I think that will drive higher levels of production uh, here in North America. In terms of what the automakers do, uh, I mentioned our business in the, in the powertrain driveline uh, areas. Uh, what I didn't mention is that 70 to 80 percent of the content in an engine and transmission is actually still manufactured by the automakers themselves. And just to give you a, a sense for that market, this year the, the market potential for engine transmission driveline for automotive and uh, as well as commercial vehicles is around $400 billion. This is a massive market that is largely captive today, but is slowly being outsourced more and more to suppliers like Linamar. So we're very excited by that opportunity because we feel that the, the growth for us could be A, significant, but also, I think importantly, give us a, a consistent level of, of sustainable growth over a long period of time because you don't outsource $400 billion overnight. Uh, you're you're going to do it slowly. You're going to slowly outsource more and more of each uh, of the content of each vehicle. And as an example, I remember with the four-speed transmissions, I mean, four-speed trans transmissions used to be pretty standard in the market in, uh, in North America. We were making transmission shafts, uh, typically, for the four-speed transmissions. We would sell them for, let's say, around $12 uh, to $15. With the six-speed transmissions that pretty much have displaced the four-speeds uh, today, we would make full clutch assemblies or shaft and shell assemblies for our customers and sell them for anywhere between, let's say, $40 and $60. So quite, you know, quite an increase in terms of content potential. In the latest uh, transmissions that are just on the design and sourcing table right now, nine and 10-speed transmissions, we're quoting well, sort of complex modules that are really more than one, uh, like a clutch module with additional componentry attached to it, that we're quoting in the neighborhood of $100 to $120 for. So you can see how the content is really changing. With every new uh, transmission or every new engine, the story is similar on the engine side. Uh, more and more of the content is being outsourced, which is very, very exciting. Uh, offshore sourcing. Uh, is on the decline. And, I, and that's probably not a surprise to you. I'm sure you've heard that the amount of business being sourced in, in China is declining. And again, there are a couple reasons for that. Number one, logistics cost. As mentioned, logistics costs are certainly increasing uh, on, uh, in, in China at a pretty significant rate. We have plants in China that we you know, use for our customers in Asia. And our wage inflation is around 12 to 15 percent a year, compared to you know, 2 to 3 percent here. Uh, in North America. If you extrapolate those lines, uh, you'll find that the labor costs would cross if that rate of inflation continued in between 15 and 19 years. That's tomorrow. Okay, 15 years from now is tomorrow. That's not even counting the increasing logistics cost. So there's a real dynamic that's changing here in terms of where product is being outsourced. And when you layer on uh, some of the lower costs that we're seeing uh, in North America, particularly in the U.S. on the energy side, it creates an even more compelling argument to uh, manufacture locally instead of uh, offshoring. Uh, so with some manufacturing centering back into North America, I think the, the question becomes who's going to get the production? For instance, who's going to get the production of the, the actual vehicle? 
Uh, and you know, I asked that question in the context of Canada. What's Canada's share of the pie going to be? And I worry that that piece of the pie is going to be shrinking. And for us at Lindemar, I mean, it doesn't matter a lot because 80 to 90 percent of what we make ships to the U.S. Anyhow, most of the powertrain plants are in the U.S., so that's where we're shipping our product regardless. But I think it matters to Canadians where this product is being produced because there's a huge multiplier effect of jobs. Six or seven jobs uh, are created for every one automotive manufacturing job. So the multiplier effect is significant and the impact on the Canadian co uh, economy is significant as a result. So how do we ensure that manufacturing uh, of vehicles stays in Canada and what are the threats to that? Well, I think there's a couple of pretty specific threats. Uh, one is the CAW. Their approach to union negotiation in comparison to the UAW is completely different. The UAW has shown themselves to be much more flexible, agreeing to tier two wage structures, et cetera. And that, I think, is, is a negative when it comes to looking at manufacturing in Canada. And I think when you couple that with the fact that many uh, states in the U.S. are implementing right-to-work legislation, I think that creates an even bigger issue for the Canadian automakers. I mentioned energy costs in the U.S. Uh, are getting cheaper. You know, we used to be at about seven cents a kilowatt hour in Canada and in the U.S. Uh, for our energy costs. Today, our energy costs at our plants in the U.S. are at about five cents a kilowatt, and here in Canada, they're nine or ten cents and growing. That's, that's rapidly be, going to become uh, a significant uh, issue, particularly for companies uh, that have heavy energy bills. And finally, incentives. You know, you go into the U.S., there's huge incentive packages available in the states, uh, you know, particularly in the southern states, for, uh, particularly for OEM assembly jobs. So, you know, I do think that these are areas that our government needs to think about and try and understand how can we ensure that the Canadian automaker jobs stay competitive. You know, when I look at our, our own costs in Canada, I mean, we've, we've been very careful to manage uh, our costs carefully. And uh, if I look at our all-in costs in Canada compared to the U.S., it's pretty much the same. Our labor costs are slightly higher. I think they're maybe 8% uh, or so higher, uh, offset, thankfully, by lower taxes, right? So our tax rate in Canada, 25% compared to 35% in the U.S., is a significant factor and actually fully offsets that uh, labor cost differential. And our energy costs, as noted, are a little bit higher, but the, happily that's a smaller percentage of sales for us. So our plants at an at par dollar are pretty much the same from a cost perspective. So, you, I mean, you can get there. You can manage your business uh, to get there. So I'm just going to finish off with a couple comments around technology, which I think you might be interested in, again, from, a, uh, from the automotive industry perspective. So, Lots of discussion, lots of uh, interest around electric vehicles and hybrid electric vehicles uh, in uh, the marketplace. Uh, you know, most forecasts are showing that electric vehicles or the combination of electric and hybrid will probably stay less than 15% of overall vehicle production for at least the next 15 to 20 years. Pure electrics are forecast to stay a little less than 5%. Uh, the, the issue is that electric vehicles still need some pretty significant technology evolution to really be able to become mainstream, with affordability being really the key, the key issue here. Range of the batteries, weight of the batteries, the battery pack is 800 kilo, huge. So it's really putting a lot of drag uh, on, uh, on the vehicle. As you know, range is an issue and degradation of the battery every year is also a key issue. So we need to see some significant evolution in battery technology in order to really get electric vehicles into the mainstream. But what I think is probably most important to understand about electric vehicles is that in a country like the US, they do virtually nothing for the environment. And by that, I mean that electricity has to come from somewhere. And in the US, the primary source of electricity is coal-fired uh, electricity plants. MIT did a study recently that looked at the well-to-wheels emissions of a variety of different types of uh, technologies, uh, vehicle technologies. And they found that the well-to-wheels emissions of an electric vehicle is not dissimilar to that of a diesel engine. And that's just because you've shifted the emissions from the tailpipe 
to the, the uh, coal-fired electricity plant. So, you know, although I think electric vehicles, you know, have a lot of potential once we develop the technology further, in order for it really to make a difference in the environment, we need to change where our energy is coming from uh, and, uh, and get away from the, the coal-fired emissions that are really not helping. Some of the other things going on technology-wise uh, in the automotive world, light weighting, uh, less noise, right, because that creates friction, which impacts uh, fuel efficiency, connectivity, so vehicles talking to each other, driverless vehicles are all sort of really interesting technologies that are being developed today and I think will become uh, more and more uh, important uh, in, in the future. So uh, looking to the future for Linamar, uh, we feel very, very confident, very excited about our opportunities to continue to grow our business. As I've described, our market uh, is really quite opportunistic. I feel like we've got a good strategy and a good product uh, and a good focus around innovation to keep ourselves competitive and keep growing. Uh, as noted, we had $3.2 billion of sales last year. We're on track for record sales. This year, we have booked business by 2017 of around $4.8 billion. So that's about 50% bigger than we were last year. And that's you know, uh, in the bag and target uh, 10 billion in the longer term and feel very confident in our ability uh, to meet that. We want to grow in a controlled way. Double digit growth is our minimum uh, goal uh, each year so that we can manage from a financial and from a people perspective uh, that growth. And I feel very confident in our ability to achieve that. So that concludes my formal comments. Uh, happy to take some questions. I think we've got a few minutes uh, for questions, and there's somebody with a microphone uh, for anyone who'd like to do that. No questions, really. I've answered all these. Can you please address some of the factors that might uh, limit those projections that you have? The factors that might limit uh, the projections of our sales growth? Uh, well, clearly markets, right? That, that uh, $4.8 billion in book business is based on current forecasts, industry forecasts of where vehicle volumes were, will go. Uh, I think those forecasts are reasonably conservative. I mean, I overall, I think it's somewhere around 2 to 3 percent of annual growth in terms of vehicle volumes. But of course, it can go offside if there's some kind of a major uh, shock, like we saw only a few years ago. So it's absolutely going to be reliant on vehicle, uh, vehicle volumes, I'd say, is the biggest risk factor. Other questions? Over there, other questions? Yeah, what do you think are some of the factors inhibiting more outsourcing from the OEMs? Well, I think uh, on the engine and transmission side, they've been reluctant to do a lot of outsourcing uh, up till now. It's really the last area of the vehicle to hit the outsourcing table because of the critical nature of those systems to the functionality of the vehicle, right? I mean, if your seat heater doesn't work, you can probably live with that. If your engine doesn't turn on, that's a little bit of a different story. So they've kind of kept that a little closer to the chest. I think they also see it to some extent as being a competitive advantage, their powertrain uh, performance. But I think they're increasingly seeing that uh, outsourcing more gives them obviously a more variable cost base so they can absorb the shocks to uh, the system, to the, the uh, volumes that might happen a little more efficiently. Uh, and also our, our area of uh, machining and assembly is highly capital intensive. So by doing some more outsourcing and balancing out what they want to do themselves and what they want to outsource, they can cut back their capital bill and give them the opportunity to invest more in R&D and uh, product uh, development. So I think that although they've been reluctant to outsource, they're increasingly recognizing uh, that, uh, that it makes sense and that uh, it's not as much of a competitive advantage as they may have, have thought. And a good example of that, actually, is we just picked up a major camshaft program, a million cams a year, from a Japanese manufacturer. It's the first time they've ever outsourced a camshaft outside uh, of their uh, Koretsu base. 
We also recently won a major connecting rod program from a German manufacturer. First time they've ever outsourced a connecting rod, period. So we're starting to see some change. We're starting to see them thinking and realizing, I think we can outsource more of this and still maintain the integrity and the performance uh, of, uh, of the, the vehicle. Question over here. Yeah. Uh, Linda, when you, um, you made, over here. Where's that? Right over Where's, I can hear, oh, okay, hi. <laughs> you made uh, some uh, comments about the advantages and disadvantages of Canadian manufacturing versus the United States. Um, when you look at the number of manufacturing jobs that we are losing to um, southern U.S. states and even Mexico increasingly, uh, are there things that Canadian policymakers at uh, both levels of government should be looking at? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I absolutely think there's things they can do. They can implement right-to-work legislation. That gives, puts us into direct, uh, so that we can compete with the southern U.S. states that have that kind of uh, a structure, uh, number one. Uh, they can uh, look at incentive programs, just like the, the, U the U.S. Uh, states are doing. I mean, the payback is immense. I think the payback's pretty easy to uh, figure out, as I'm sure you know very well, uh, in looking at... Uh, you, when, if you help to support an investment, the kind of uh, uh, extra jobs, that six or seven jobs for every manufacturing job, and all the taxes that are going to flow in from that, I think it's a pretty easy case to make uh, to, uh, to do more around the incentive side. And I think we've got to get our heads around the energy piece as well. And I'm not suggesting that we you know, go away from sustainable energy production, quite the opposite. I think that we need to figure out a way uh, that we can have low cost and environmentally efficient uh, energy, and I believe that that we can do that. It's a matter of investing in those uh, in those areas and making sure that we've got globally competitive energy costs without sacrificing the environment. Go ahead. Thank you for that, Linda. Um, one, uh, there's often challenges passing a company down from generation to generation. In your mind, what, what are some of the things that has allowed you to be so successful? You mean in terms of uh, like passing on through generations? Correct, and uh, yeah. the transition period, and uh, what do you think has differentiated what you've done versus a lot of other companies that have been passed down and have failed and that sort of thing? Well, I think that uh, a, a couple of things. Pardon me, did you want to answer that? Uh, the mic. I, I have to say, uh, I think uh, uh, my father's attitude has been absolutely critical. He's always been so supportive of me, never undermined me, you know, never, never tried to take a decision away from me, never uh, undermined me in front of our, our people or in front of outside people. He's always been hugely uh, supportive, and I think that that's absolutely key. Uh, I think um, clear um, clarity around who's doing what. Uh, I mean, I remember when uh, my father said I was um, president, uh, and he said, I think it's time to make you CEO. He was CEO at the time. And I said, uh, well, if I'm going to be CEO, what are you going to do? <laughs> and he said, well, you know, same thing I'm doing now. I said, well, no, I mean, that you can't, I mean, if I'm going to be CEO, then I need to be CEO. And I, you know, I know there's things you're going to want to do, but let's identify what those, those are. And, uh, well, that took a little bit of time to, uh, to narrow down, but eventually I got him on an, on an airplane by himself and I made him write down the four things that he was going to do, uh, you know, cost reductions with, uh, with our plants, so doing cost reduction exercises with them, getting involved with some of the capital equipment negotiating and disposal because he loves to do that, and of course being chairman of the board, and I made him sign it. And I still have it in my uh, desk drawer. So uh, if there's ever any question around uh, that, we could pull that. We can pull that document out. <laughs> maybe I should file it with our, our lawyers. That might be a better uh, better idea. So clarity of roles. You know, you've got to support the transition. And I've had the benefit of working with my father for the last 20 years, and still learn something from him every single day. So that's key as well. I mean, you can't just hand the reins over and then head to Florida, you know, you need to be able to coach and mentor and, and be there to give advice uh, because I value that advice and I think that that's been a key part of the success as well. Are there any more questions? Okay. Thanks very much for your attention.
please welcome Mr. Bliss White from Blake's to say the appreciation. Thank you very much. Um, well, uh, my name is Bliss White. Um, I am a partner at the law firm of Blake Castles in Graydon, and uh, one of my responsibilities there is to coordinate the uh, activities of our automotive industry practice group. Um, we at Blake's are very proud of our long-standing relationship with Linamar and our deep involvement in the Canadian auto industry on behalf of our clients. And as a result, we are very pleased to sponsor this event with the Empire Club here today. I'd like to thank Linda Hassan-Fratz for sharing with us today her thoughtful observations on the global auto industry and Canada's position within it. Um, the, uh, Linda's insights are based on um, her um, successful leadership in the industry through good times and bad, and for some, but uh, including Linamar, but not all, uh, better times again. Um, we know that the, um, the auto industry is moving through a period of, uh, a challenging period of uh, reinvention, uh, spurred on by a perfect storm of uh, conditions, truly global competition, um, um, dealing with regional excess capacity, technological innovation, environmental challenge, and as an existential threat, the financial crisis of 2008. Um, Linda, um, in addition to leading Linamar successfully through that crisis, um, was also a, uh, an early, you know, a eloquent and effective spokesperson for the Canadian auto industry um, in general, <clears throat> uh, calling for specific policies to support the, uh, uh, the survival and growth of the, uh, of the Canadian auto industry coming out of that crisis. Um, we we, uh, we uh, were witness to that again today, uh, and we thank her for it. And Linda, as a uh, token of our appreciation on behalf of the club, uh, we'd like to present you with this book. It's uh, called Who Said That? Memorable Notes, Quotes, and Anecdotes, a select selection of 110 years of employer club Great. speeches. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Uh, at your tables, you'll have uh, a number of our upcoming events. Uh, we have Patrick Boissier, Chairman and CEO of DCNS, on November 21st, and the Honorable Bob Ray, uh, speaking on Aboriginal issues, on November 26th at the Arcadian Court. I'd like to thank Blake's uh, for sponsoring this event this afternoon. Thank you very much for your support. I'd like to thank the National Post as our print media sponsor and to Van Valkenburg for providing our AV. This meeting will be aired on Rogers TV and we are grateful for your ongoing support. We are on Twitter and on Facebook and uh, membership information is available on our website which is empireclub.org. Thank you all for coming. We look forward to seeing you again soon. This meeting of the Empire Club of Canada is now adjourned. Thank you.